morning, everyone. Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, may you use me. Speak to your people. Speak to me as well. Let your wisdom flow through me. And let your word speak to the situations of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, David, for that beautiful prayer. And thank you for reading the scripture, Maggie. Uh, before I start, uh, uh, I'm an accountant. We are very conservative people, so um, I'm a bundle of knobs. Um, and, and, and so to shake it off, I'll, I'll share some, a few jokes, uh, if you may say that. Uh, it's, it's a pastor's joke, I guess, uh, uh, that I'm Dennis Kibaya and I'm married to one wife. Most pastors say that. Uh, you'd, you'd wonder, do you have more than one wife? Hmm. Uh, but I'm married to Grace and we have three children, um, two before the pandemic hit. So the youngest is 10 months now, uh, a boy. Many of you know the other two uh, uh, girls, Eliana and Moriah, um, and Micah, who's now 10, 10 months, uh, quite a handful. Eliana turned seven today, so that's, that's a father's joy. Um, and the other bit is that I get to dress up. Uh, it's, it's been a while that uh, in this era of having meetings where we dress halfway up, um, and, and, and get to wear shorts or pajama pants and uh, attend very important meetings or office meetings. Um, I get to dress up. Uh, it, it feels good. Uh, I, I think I've lost weight. Um, that's a good thing. <laughs> I was worried my clothes wouldn't fit. Um, I'd like to get into my sermon. And... Uh, I, I, I don't know if you, you, you saw the outline. Um, my sermon is entitled, Afraid. And uh, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I chose that name to provoke some thoughts and curiosity out of you, uh, based on the scripture that we've read. And as we start, I'd like to pose these two questions to all of us, and, and indeed to our online congregation as well. What are some of the things that you're afraid of? How have you handled yourself when faced with these fears or even these situations? Many of us, and I admit I'm included in that, are afraid of many things. We are afraid of failure, joblessness, being broke, homelessness. I see a lot of people asking for money on the roadsides. That for me is a point of homelessness. I'm afraid of uncertainty of the future, afraid of the past, and most likely the fear of it catching up to us if you've hidden it. I'm afraid of being alone. Most of us are. COVID has brought us face to face with many challenges. Death, loss of loved ones, sickness. We have broken relationships, you know. On a light note, <laughs> I'm afraid of heights. I hate flying. It's the fear of knowing my feet are not on solid ground. I pray a lot when I'm flying. <laughs> um, we are afraid of many things. I'm afraid of what people think about me. Currently, I'm retaking my CPA final exam. The word retake tells you that I did not pass it the first time. And guess what my fear is? That I will fail again. 
I'm afraid what people would think. They'd probably think I'm dumb if I fail again. That seems silly, right? It's, it's still a fear. A valid one. But I think most of us are afraid of being in control. When you're not in control of your circumstances, you feel like you're lost, you know, things are going helter-skelter. And that's where David comes into the picture. Psalm 34 <clears throat> is David's prayer written when David pretended to be insane before Abimelech the king, who drove him away and he left. To give you some context, we first get to hear of David in chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when God sends Samuel out to Jesse's home to anoint a king. This is after God had rejected Saul as king over Israel. Now what's interesting is that David is the youngest of Jesse's sons. We are told that, you know, when Samuel got there, they started coming in, you know. And, and when you read through later scriptures, later, later scriptures, you, you discover some were in the army. I'd assume some were generals, so they had thousand, few thousands of men under their command. Those were accomplished men. But David was the youngest, a shepherd boy, tending his father's sheep. You'd say he was unnoticeable, unknown, a nobody. But what's interesting is that God's ways are not our ways. And in verse 7b of 1 Samuel chapter 16, he speaks to Samuel saying, people look at the outward appearance like what they did with Saul. They looked around and said, hey, our neighbors have kings, we want one. Then they went to the tribe of the Benjamites and they chose the strongest and good looking. Someone who had the outward appearance. But guess where God looks at? He looks at the heart. David had a heart for God and for the things of God. So this anointing comes in fulfillment of 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, when Samuel tells Saul that the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people, over his people. Saul had lost favor with God. So after the anointing, David goes on to serve Saul. We are told he plays the lair for the king when you, you know, the evil spirit would invade him. And then it would leave. And then later on, he served Saul as an armor bearer. Almost feels like very mundane tasks for an anointed king. In chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, David goes out and defeats Goliath. In chapter 18, he becomes a leader in Saul's army. Goes on to win numerous battles, gains experience. People love him. They sing his praises. We are told even the people in Saul's army loved him as well. People gathered in the streets just to sing his praises. So we're starting to see David move from shepherd boy and nobody onto somebody, something, you know, progression. All these had Saul jealous of David and he tried to kill him. In chapter 19, David then escapes and runs to Ramah. And he told Saul what had happened. They set forth together to Nabal. 
We are told that later David returns back to his friend Saul, Jonathan's, so Jonathan, sorry, who is Saul's son, to plead his case on behalf, to plead his case to the king. But this was to no success. And at this point, you know, David feared for his life and he flees. It's interesting. David was Saul's son-in-law. He had already given Michal as a wife to David. Then your, other, your son is also his best friend. But David was will, Saul was willing to make his daughter a widow. And guess what? He wanted to kill his son as well while pleading the case for David. We are told Saul was so angry. Out of anger, that's in chapter 20, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 33, that Saul hardly speared Jonathan to kill him. That's when he knew that his father wanted to kill David. So David finds himself in a very difficult spot and, sets, and this sets off a chain of events. Even though we know David is a man after God's own heart, at this very moment, in this crisis, he falters. He starts to do things he shouldn't be doing. He takes matters into his own hands. Fast forward into chapter 21, he goes off to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And guess what? He lies to him to get food. What kind of food? Consecrated food. Bread. And what else? He needed a weapon. And what did he take? Goliath's sword. <laughs> Interesting, right? Thereafter, he flees to Gath, where servants of Achish, the king of Gath, recognize him as David, the giant slayer. Now, I'm wondering, how do you run to the place where you hated the most? That's interesting. While carrying the weapon of the person you slayed, I'd, I'd presume Goliath was the best military strategy the Philistines had. So he was a known person. Probably his sword was marked in a way you would tell it is Goliath. So we told the servants, take him to the king. And David is very much afraid. He pretends to be insane, acting like a madman. He clawed at doors, let saliva run down his beard. Nachish is thinking, what's all this? Pure madness, you know. Get him out of my sight, you know. This is not royalty. Away with him. But wait a minute. You think he got out of it. But at that very moment, David was still alone. David had no one with him and no one to turn to. Wanted in Israel by King Saul and unwanted in Gath. And so he flees to the cave of Adullam. I imagine this at this point that he starts to write this psalm. So I've, I've provided some context. I'd like to provide another. First Kings chapter 18. We draw similarities in Elijah's story. He seeks an audience with King Ahab through Obadiah, the king's palace administrator. Hey, 
Let's meet. It's been a while, you know. Scripture says it's about three years in and there's a severe famine in Samaria. When he meets King Ahab at Mount Carmel, Baal was accompanied by 450 prophets of Baal. Sorry, the king, King Ahab, was, was accompanied by 450 prophets of Baal. And Elijah tells the king in verse 21 of that, First Kings chapter 18, how long will you waver between two options, opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. At the end of the chapter, Elijah's sacrifice to God is accepted, and with it comes rain. But for the prophets of Baal, they meet their doom. They were all put down. They were slain. But in chapter 19, you'd expect, at the end of chapter 18, we're told that he tells King Ahab, go ahead, a rain is coming. And then God takes over Elijah's body and he overtakes the chariot of, of the king. You, I'd call that a God high right there. But in chapter 19, after Hale tells Jezebel all that had transpired and the fact that 450 of Baal's prophets were dead, this is the message to Elijah from Jezebel. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow I do not take your life, make your life like that of one of them. We are told that Elijah was afraid and ran for his life into the wilderness. He came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. From that high to fear, you'd imagine, you know, you raise your hands and God accepts your sacrifice. They say he even licked the water that had been poured over, it, over, over the sacrifice. It was dry, scorched. Then he gives him all of Baal's prophets. Takes over his body and he outruns a chariot. But Jezebel's words were enough. This is my opinion. At that very point, his prayer was out of anger, sort of frustration. How do you ask God to take you? Kill me. Let me die, God, you know. So in the backdrop of, of that, let's get back to the psalm. This psalm speaks to me. Just like David, we all go through times where we, we have crisis, we encounter tough situations, and we stumble in our faith. But what follows is what sets us off the path. We take matters into our own hands. And alas, we discover that we are in a spiritual wilderness. I still take you back to the beginning. What are you afraid of? In this psalm, it talks of David's fears in verse 4 and the fear of the Lord in verse 7. I'd like to take a pause and talk about this. I pose to all of us that there is deliverance from our fears and that is in walking in the fear of the Lord. What does that mean, you know? I found an interesting quote from someone called Paul Tripp. And this is how he describes the fear of the Lord. The fear of God means that my life is structured by a sense of awe, worship, obedience that flows out of recognizing 
God and his glory. So God becomes the single most important reference point for all that I think, desire, do, or even say. God is my motive, and God is my ultimate goal. The fear of God is meant to be the most central organizing force in my life. Are you walking in the fear of the Lord? Is God the central force in your life? What dictates what you do? What dictates what you say? Think, desire. Is it your fears or is it God? Proverbs 9.10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do we fear the Lord enough to let him speak into our situations, into our actions, into our thoughts? Do we fear the Lord enough to let him speak through us? So here is what I take away from this piece of scripture. When we walk in the fear of the Lord, we will lead a life of worship. Verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 34 says, the NIV, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will, be, will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. It's interesting that in the midst of these fears, David offers worship. But I, I think it comes to the realization that God is worthy of praise at all times. The truth is we lose sight of that because we only tie worship to circumstances, to our situations. When things are good and dandy, we thank God. But when we are facing challenges, we lose focus and move away from God being the single most important reference point. And guess where we turn to? Our fears. All through scripture in Samuel, we are told that God was with David, right? from when he was selected and appointed king. Scripture says, I have, I have found someone who is after my own heart. That's what God says to someone. To when he was anointed king by Samuel himself. To when he was playing the liar for King Saul. We are told that whoever when Saul reached out to find someone who could play music for him, one of his servants said, I know someone, and God is with him. To when he killed Goliath, when he waged wars against Israel's enemies and led the army, God was always with him. But the fear of losing his life overshadowed his fear of the Lord, and he momentarily lost focus. From a young and known shepherd boy, David became somebody every, everyone knew, but he lost focus. And sometimes it's, it's, it just takes God taking all that away for you to realize it was never about you, but what God can do in your situations. And sometimes that's what God does to us. He has to break us to bring us back to focus. And when we think we are somebody that we can do things by our own strength, God reminds us otherwise. We all aspire success, as we should, but most times we lose focus and instead of boasting in the Lord, more often than not, get tempted and start boasting in ourselves and our achievements. Instead of walking in the fear of the Lord, we lose focus and we start walking our own way. 
Do you know something, brothers and sisters? It is in these moments when we are humble that when the word of God becomes real. In verse 2, David tells us, let the afflicted, other versions say humbled, hear and rejoice. He was humbled. We rejoice because we rest in the assurance that God loves us even when we are not worthy of his love. And when this happens, guess what? We want to lead a life of worship. And you want others to join you. Verse 3 aptly captures that. Glory, glorify the Lord with, that, with me. Let us exalt his name together. He calls others to worship. So when we lead a life of worship, we desire, when we walk in the fear of the Lord, we lead a life of worship and we desire to worship with others. Come, let us rejoice together. Number two. When we walk in the fear of the Lord, we lead a life of prayer. Verses four to six. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. So David shares his prayer. But he also calls us to prayer. How? In verse 5 he says, those who look to him are radiant. He says that the Lord answered him and delivered him from all fears. He also says that when he, a poor man, called the Lord hard and saved him out of all his troubles. But how is this possible? And, and I was just trying to piece this together. I'm thinking, David is in the cave. Elijah, you know, um, after laying down, after that prayer in anger, lay down and, and slept. The angel came, woke him up. He ate, slept again. He got woken up a second time, ate, and he had enough strength to journey 40 days, we're told, and 40 nights. Landed in a cave as well. Interesting, right? They all landed in caves. But I guess that's where they needed to be. Alone with God. So David is in a cave, alone, unable to go back to Israel. On Philistine's kill list. <laughs> so... How is he saved out of his troubles? And so I looked at verse 5. And, and this is what I thought. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. David came to the realization that when his fears and troubles took over his life, he forgot who he served, the one true God who was with him in every stage of his life, from a nobody to a somebody. David had wandered away from God and into a spiritual wilderness, and God revealed this to him when he prayed and sought him. God revealed his shame that when he was faced with his fears, he looked to his own ways and had wandered away from God. My prayer is that as we pray and seek God, that he would reveal to us our shame and that he would take away the shame that has covered us and replace it with radiance. Scripture indeed reminds us in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, 
And also verse 13, that whoever looks to him will not be disappointed or put to shame for other versions. And whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us learn to call on the Lord constantly. And to my third and last point, when we walk in the fear of the Lord, we lead a life of peace. Verse 7 and 8 reads, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Test and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Some random, random day, I took the girls out um, in the evening. Um, long day. I needed to transition from work to studying, but I needed a break, and so we went for a drive, all three. And uh, I did that because Grace needed a break. Um, busy day, meetings, um, and I hate meetings. Accountants hate meetings. Uh, right, John? Or is it only me? Oh. <laughs> I, I think my assumption is uh, usually figures speak for themselves, uh, but, but I digress. <laughs> um, many meetings, um, and, and, and so Grace really had to take care of the kids, and uh, she just needed a break. So we went for a drive, and, and we ended up at this park because the kids figured, we know this road, and, and Daddy, let's... Let's pass by the playground. So they went to the playground, and I stayed with Micah. And uh, soon enough, I saw friends, and I figured, let me go say hi. Um, and, but I was watching over them. And uh, I guess when they lifted their eyes, I was not there. To them, where they left me, I, I was not there. And so they panicked, and Eliana held her younger sister's hand, and they started walking to us back to the car. And immediately I ran after them. I ran after them, and I called out to them. And when they saw me, they said, oh, there you are, you know. Um, I, I saw panic, and then I saw relief um, soon thereafter, and, and asked, where were you headed? And they said, we thought you had gone back to the car. Um, but soon after that, they were assured that I was there. And they went back playing. So panic to relief. David had wandered into a, a physical, but also a spiritual wilderness. And had lost sight of God. And as he sought and called to God, he experienced God's presence and goodness. And he shares this in verse 8, very aptly, you know. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blesses the one who takes refuge in him. When we walk in the Lord, we experience God's goodness and blessings, even in the midst of our fears. We just have to walk in the fear of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, do we have peace this morning? Or are we bombarded by our fears? I still pose the question I asked earlier, what are you afraid of? Do you know that fears rob you of the joy and peace that comes with resting and walking in the fear of the Lord? When we walk in the fear of the Lord, all other fears die and with our way, and we enjoy peace, joy, and blessings. So as I finish, I say this, walking in our own way will lead us to a spiritual wilderness, but walking in the fear of the Lord will lead you to a life of worship, a life of prayer, and a life of peace. And guess what? You know, David's brothers joined him in the cave 
and so were other men. He was never alone. And then he moved on, I, I believe, to Moab, um, trying to seek refuge, but he was never alone. And so was Elijah. God spoke to him, sent 400 men to help him. But more importantly, God asked him to anoint a helper, Elisha. There was his peace, but there was his help as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we rest in your assurance that you are peace and you are joy. And even when fears invade us, that we can call on you and you will answer. And so present ourselves to thee, O Lord, and we lay our fears at your feet. And we ask that, Lord, would you take control? Bless us and reach our lives. Help us lead a life of worship. Help us lead a life of prayer. And Father, Lord, give us a life of peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.